Hi, James. How you doing? Great. Happy to Fantastic. be here. Yeah. I, uh, I'm really glad that you uh, you had a, a time to kind of discuss this with me. I, I know that uh, you know I've got a background as an AppSec practitioner, but it, it has been a little while since I've been living the the life day to day, and I know that you're kind of in the in the thick of it with with your position. Um, you know, I, so I just I really wanted to, have, to kind of pick your brain a little bit. I know that you're in your org, you're using a lot of you know LLM type stuff to do security research and and security assessment type stuff, um, and I, you know, that freaks a lot of people out, right? So, uh, you know, we've been talking about that internally. I've, I've had colleagues talking about it all over the place. And so it's kind of piqued my curiosity a little bit of like, uh, you know, how, how can I use this in my org? How can I, you know, how can I advise people to use it in theirs? Um, how can I do that safely? Those kinds of things. So maybe you want to like give a little introduction of like who you are and, and uh, why you know this stuff? Yeah. Uh, so my name's James and uh, LLM stuff is new enough that really anyone can lay claim to uh, knowing a lot about it. And there's definitely a lot of beginner sort of resources out there, but I immediately wanted to test it. Cause so with, with the project that I run Lacio tech, it's really meant to be a one-stop shop for learning about all of the vendors in a given space. And the reason for creating that was fundamentally that I don't want the reason you don't pick a tool to ever be because you just didn't know about it. Um, Cause I've been frustrated with that where so many calls I would have do an evaluation and be like, oh, if I only knew about you last year, but we signed a three-year contract, that sort of thing. So as part of doing that, I've touched a, a ton of different people that are ultimately doing what I would consider configuration scanning. And configuration scanning is the thing that uh, there's no reason a lot of developers are looking at LLMs and using it to do stuff like automatically summarize the changes in this pull request, uh, try to optimize the function to make it faster, look for inefficiencies. So the obvious thing is to just apply that to security. And there's honestly been a lot of like weird uh, hesitation from security teams around a desire to like embrace the technology. But I think fundamentally, uh, what it does for security has been extremely groundbreaking. So I set out and I made a video uh, comparing chat GPT to sneak code. So specifically on the SAS side. And I went into that video uh, sort of with the attitude that I think most security people do, which is uh, expecting security, expecting chat GPT to do a lot worse of a job than an actual paid tool. And then I came out of it going like, wow, ChatGPT actually did insanely better. Uh, like it wasn't even close how much better it did at identifying not just like hypothetical SAST issues, but go ahead and assuming like, hey, you went ahead and disabled HTTPS only on your admin uh, link. That's probably not what you meant to do, which is the kind of thing that a SAS scanner would just never have that level of detail to be like, oh, this is a Django app. And like, we're looking at the admin like trying to write a rule for that is going to be really difficult. And so really, I, I've been exploring a lot the potential of AI as a application security scanner, uh, especially because of all this configuration scanning merging into more and more like single platform type uh, pushes. So that's the high level. Um, and really what I want to do today is, is talk about sort of the different areas of scanning, because there's a lot of different areas of application security scanning and where uh, where AI does a really good job and where it is not going to do uh, as well. Awesome. Yeah, that, that's going to help me a lot, because like in my in my role at Ender Labs, like we're really focused on kind of, you know, after the boom type, type stuff like we're, you know, we're, we're focused on, uh, you know, open source dependencies right now and then kind of moving uh, moving right in the SDLC to like CI type configuration and, uh, you know, pipeline attestation and those kinds of things. And, you know, it's, we have the benefit of being a startup. And so you know, we've already integrated AI in a couple of ways to be an advisor, but we're always looking for, for new ways to do that. So I'm really curious as to like, you know, what your testing has shown and if you've seen people like do these in real programs and, and what the results are. Yeah, and the the fundamental difficulty with scaling this out is uh, the lack of consistency between responses. Like you'd have to create some bizarre system where like the AI is interpreting its own results to try to like assign IDs to something so that you could like track it in a dashboard. Uh, so I don't think it's very good at, at like that. It just doesn't scale the way that an enterprise software 
would need to scale uh, in like the database of findings sort of sense of it. But it does an amazing job at like point analysis, especially when you consider like token limits. Um, so within this application that I've built, um, that does some of this, uh, all it does is send your code to OpenAI. Um, it has to use the really large and expensive GPT-4 model to even have a chance of scanning your entire application. And then the finding quality also sort of reduces because it's trying to communicate a lot of data and put it all together that it's approaching its max model size or its max token size. And it's really struggling to do all of that. But where, and, and it's super expensive because you have to pay for the new preview model to get it in there. Um, but where it really excels is on partial scans where you're just like doing a git diff on a few files. There it can really do a great job at seeing like, did I make this more or less secure? Um, and then it can go ahead and guess and assume uh, and provide that sort of instant feedback that is really hard to get from like a peer security review. Yeah, that makes sense. Like that, I really like the that use of like an LLM as as a research assistant, right, or as an advisor. Um, I think a lot of the fears from using it comes from this idea of you know people and, and companies and people and and you know people kind of banging the drum on it are often like, well, you know, you can just ask it this question and you get this answer that you can get just trust and. It sounds like one of the things you're saying is like you have to be really careful about trusting output because, you know, it's it's got limitations and you have to understand those limitations a little bit. So, like, how do you go through, like, thinking about designing a query to get something useful and, and like kind of adjacent to that? Like, what kinds of things don't work? You mentioned, like, whole app scans don't work very well. But what other kinds of inputs just aren't very reliable? Yeah, well, I think it might be helpful if we just because I can just show some of this. Oh, that'd be um, great. As far as uh hopefully am i sharing my right screen yes okay um so this is the Latio application security tester which is a fancy name for uh i basically this is what i find scary about ai is i wrote this app in like a weekend but it's it can provide eight in one application scanning which is the kind of thing you would need like vc funding and a dedicated team of engineers to like build that functionality um, but here, since all that it's really doing for uh, all of the code is ultimately it comes to this message that gets sent uh, where it's sending the model and then you give it a role that says you're an application security expert, skilled in doing all the things and then telling it <clears throat> the, the big thing that I find is, is telling it what data you're going to send it so that it knows ahead of time, like how to parse it and what uh, to deal with. And so that's saying... For the full scan here, it's um, receiving the full code for the application, looking for security vulnerabilities, telling it this was a direct reaction to it kept, it would get all of the data and then it would just only focus on one file. So telling it, hey, you're, we, I want you to iterate through all of the files and then sort of prioritize what it's doing. Um, and we can actually try this with a um, full scan. And this full scan is going to cost me a dollar, so you're welcome. <laughs> Uh, because the full scan really uh, takes a while. And that's so this is an example of uh, before when I did this, the testing repo was smaller, but now it's too big <laughs> to even to even do the full scan. Uh, so what I can do instead is just pass it a specific file like um, the insecure app. And this insecure app uh, uh, all this configuration is that we're scanning is like the most comically insecure app you could ever make in your life, um, where it's just it's taking requests from the user and then running them directly on the server. And it's accepting file uploads and just dumping them directly onto the server. Uh, so I made this as an it like just comically to get an idea of like how workflows work and how findings work for different tools more than like any specific like I'm not trying to trick the, the SAS with some complicated like rooted nested stuff um it should be all pretty simple uh so this full scan is going to take a minute because it's doing a lot um so have you, have you found issues given that kind of like maximum maximum content length and stuff like that have you found issues with getting like reduced quality results because you can't give it all the context it needs um, sort of. So the, the partial scan is what I use more often, like as an actual thing. And this is where what it's doing is it's only sending the, the git diff. And then it's also sending the content of those files. 
And so it's a lot better at at tying those things together. But I've actually been pretty shocked with um with what this full scan does, for example, where uh, someone commented on the LinkedIn post saying like, uh, I, I did an article about how it was someone else who had done an article about how ChatGBT didn't detect the zero day that they found by hand. And they used mm -hmm. it as like a, a, a proof that it's not as good as a human investigator. But then I scanned just because obviously the full scan, the token limit was too small to ingest the entire app. So they're correct about that. But I fed it like just the directory and it didn't say like, hey, there's an issue with the output from this function, but it said, hey, you are outputting things here. You should check if it's encoded properly, which was the issue that he discovered. And so it really gave the hint of like, you should go here and do this thing. Um, so I really find that it it doesn't actually miss much. And like here you can see exactly what I pointed out, right? It's, it's saying that I can execute whatever I want. I can upload whatever files I want. Uh, I'm exposing environment variables in the Docker file. I have deep, this is, this is the kind of finding that, um, I get the most happy with as well as, uh, this one, this concerns with the Docker file where it's like, these are things that you're not going to see programmed into like a SAST necessarily, uh, where like, oh, it's not checking that debug's true because like, if it's in a lower environment, that might not matter. Like it's false positive, but this is able to sort of pick up this is a more common example because it's a flask app. But if I'm using some weird thing that most people don't use, it would still catch that like it's got this nuance in the config file that most SaaS tools are not scanning for. And same with um, here where I'm just apt getting without pinning versions. Like that's the kind of thing where no tool is going to say like, oh, you're not version pinning. That's bad. But it's like, well, it's... It, it, it's just, it's kind of that feedback that's like, oh, I probably should do that. Um, yeah. Yeah, it seems like a lot of this stuff is that kind of like low-hanging fruit stuff that's really annoying to find in like a scan as a developer, right? Like, because yes, I finally yeah. got this thing and now I'm not going to bug me about some, you know, relatively easy to fix thing, but now I got to do a whole another build, right? Whole another deploy, yeah. whole another CI run. Uh, and a lot of this stuff is like, it's exactly this, right? Like, you know, I, I've, I've worked for a number of security companies over the years and like, this is this low hanging fruit stuff is often the hardest to reliably detect. Yes. So sure. it's, it's kind of cool that you got like good results relatively rapidly for stuff that's like, look, this is just bad practice. That's why I, I'm constantly like mind blown that like I, I built this because I kept sort of waiting for someone else to just make this like open source whatever or just in building it into like their existing tool set because it's so valuable for the amount of time that it took me to write this. Like this, anyone who's an actual Python developer can look at this and go like, wow, James is not a very good developer, right? Like we're not, there's no object oriented programming happening here. There's no uh, uh, optimizations for speed. It's just purely like, you know, get the code, send it to the system. <laughs> and then it responds better than most things would. Um, yeah. I then, mean, that, kind of, that kind of informs something I was curious about too, which is like, you know, people have been talking a little bit, you know, kind of the chatter online has been kind of focused on, well, hey, maybe, you know, maybe ChatGPT as a general purpose LLM has some weaknesses with this kind of thing. But, you know, what about like custom trained models? But here you're using a generally chain, trained model. And really the only issue is that its data might be kind of old. Yep. And that's right? exactly so that's a good transition into because um, I wanted what I've done from here as well is in this example for us, uh, I've added specific vulnerabilities uh, so that we can see which classes of vulnerabilities it does a good job and a bad job identifying because this is where the details sort of do come up where it is so good as like a i would run this on every pull request which i've also got like these example github actions in here if someone wanted to do that like it's as simple as pip installing the package and then running it um but uh more more high level like if i'm if i actually want to report on every instance of log4j across my code base like that's where it gets a little hairy to try to do that more in-depth uh functionality and especially on the model side like you were saying i think there's been way too much like hype around you got to use this model for this thing or this model for this thing like the the open ai model is super good and it's trained on a ton of code like that's it, the 
it is so good at coding and uh, code analysis because that's a lot of what they put into the model training data set. Um, so it's not something where I, well, something I want to do is make it so that the scanner can run to test sort of different models, but I really haven't seen any limitations based on uh, pure code analysis. It's more when you're doing stuff like, hey, debug this bootstrap issue I'm having, and then it'll return results from like bootstrap three as opposed to bootstrap five. Because it doesn't yeah, know. so so there, there's where it runs into limits and things like you know you're trying to do you know where do I have vulnerabilities in my dependencies or things where like recency really matters or right. if there's like a novel attack technique or something that's that like nobody has really discussed before it's not going to know about it yeah um, and but that's like where... yeah like as, as a as an appsec practitioner like ninety percent of the stuff that we found that reported to our dev teams was not new right it was sql injection it was yep. cross-site scripting it was bad configuration it's stuff that's been known about for decades in some cases yeah and that's uh i really wanted to create this because uh to be honest i i went in to the, it's very similar to the sneak video where like in preparation for doing this i went into it with that assumption that it was going to like not get sca findings at all um and you're correct that it didn't get like the latest stuff, which is why I used um, two different versions here of a URL lib to sort of make this uh, point where uh, it caught this one, but it didn't catch this one. And that's where, uh, but I was impressed that it even caught this, for example, like that's something where, uh, so yeah, I mean, I can, let's walk through some of the different things that are here. Uh, so this is to test SCA is this uh, URL lib finding and essentially all this does is allow header manipulation so it's like a really simple vulnerability where if someone were actually using this uh connection which again this is a it, i'm not actually calling this anywhere and sometimes it tells me that i'm not or not um but it it still notices like hey this is vulnerable to to a header injection and this is like the test of how you would test it um so this is an sca type of finding uh, and then that's why I uploaded this here is this version is vulnerable to it, but this version's not. And so I wanted to test like if it would know like, oh, you're on a vulnerable version versus not on a vulnerable version. And I'll run it so we can see. But it actually said like you're on an old version, but it didn't say you're on a vulnerable version, but it did point out the, that it was older. Then here I just added like some fake Postgres off. This is the thing it's an incredibly good at is like infrastructure is code type uh, secret stuff. Um, this is obviously a pretty basic example of like hiding secret keys, which these aren't real, by the way, um, in the, in the YAML file, but, uh, it, it can do a really good job at detecting where you're like calling in environment variables and raising potential issues with that. And then here I, I wanted to see how it did with Docker stuff. And so I just did an easy one of specifying Python two, which would obviously like, that's a pretty easy security vulnerability. Um, so that's, the idea at a high level was I want to catch container scanning. Like it, if you were buying a tool, this would be a container scanning tool. This would buy be an SCA tool. Uh, this would be a SAS tool where it's just printing the, this is comical again, where like it's just printing the environment variables whenever someone sends any post request. Um, but that would be a SAS tool. And then this would be IAC and secrets. And this would again be SCA. So if you're like running an AppSec program to detect everything in this one uh, commit, you would need at least five different tools or some combination of like, maybe somebody does a couple of them or not to get it done. Um, but if I just run a partial here, uh, it's telling me, here's the files that I'm, that, it, that I'm sending it. Here's the git diff that I'm sending it. And then we'll get the response here. I think it's pretty cool that it can like really understand the diff formats, right? Because I've seen yes. with some of the early machine learning stuff, like if you had unusual diffs, or, I mean, the, the format standard, but like if you had something complicated, it would just kind of mess up, right? It just yes. like couldn't understand what was actually going on. So that's really cool that it's it's capable of doing that. And that was what, 15 seconds? Yeah, it, that's what, you know, it's also faster than if you were to buy five separate <laughs> tools to do it all. Uh, so here it's, you know, it's catching the Postgres off. I didn't, I forgot that I did this Telnet thing, <laughs> but it still caught it. Uh, I also opened the Telnet port as like an obvious, like, hey, you probably shouldn't do that. Um, 
So, yep, don't don't use Telnet. Uh, don't store secrets in the environment variables. Python 2 is no longer supported, which is this is a really obvious one. I'd have to experiment more with like a more different thing. But here's where I also um, instructed the model to try to provide code fixes when it can. So that's a whole nother segment of the industry is like automated code fixes, whatever. But here it's just telling me, you know, here's the fixed line of code. Um, mm. In the the insecure app, so this is where it's telling me ever it's telling me both that I'm not calling the the connection, uh, which is reachability analysis, sort of right. If I really wanted to buzzword this into oblivion, um, it's noticing that the commented out code doesn't do anything and is just confusing. That that's actually a really cool feedback because like that's like with my developer hat on like. Being able to see not just like, oh, you have a security problem, but like, hey, dude, this is don't leave this in there because it would be bad <laughs> in some way. Yes. It's, that's amazing. Um, and this is where I, I actually want to rerun this because here uh, no security vulnerabilities were found in this file when very clearly there are extremely insecure things in there. And it's doing right. that print M thing, which I it every other time I've run this, it's shown that. And so this gets at the like repeatability problem with this yeah. stuff. Um, but maybe if I wasn't overloading it with like a million different, well, here, let's actually, we can try that too. Uh, if I only send it, the insecure app changes. Oh. Oh, I have to send it a specific file. Nope. Oh, cause yeah. Uh, we're just gonna do that again. Um, but if I go back up here to the requirements, this is this is again where it see it knows that it's an old library and it doesn't know that there are vulnerabilities with it, but it's saying like, hey, there's you know, there's probably bad vulnerabilities on it. And then it's it's giving me the wrong latest version. Yeah. So the advice is gonna be a little bit problematic when you need recency stuff. Yeah. Right. That makes sense. So, I mean, like, if this is kind of looking to me like uh, the way that a lot of people use SEMGRAP in, the, in dev, like for security stuff, is like basically don't keep making the same mistake over and over. Because, right. you know, people, people will run SEMGRAP and there's lots of community rules and then they'll, you know, they'll add a few of their own that are like, hey, we fixed this like four times and now it's just going to fail the SEMGRAP test because we built a pattern for it. This seems kind of in that class of tool in a way. And it's cheap, right? It's cheap to run. Where, you yeah, know, you the, can have a developer going, you know, hey, look, I, you know, just show me things and it's going to catch not everything. It's not going to be always reliable, but it's going to catch a lot of obvious stuff. And then you have like at an enterprise scale, you'd have like proper enterprise tools as a backstop. Right. That's exactly how I'm thinking about it. Um, and I'll I can open up my uh, payment here to, to just see, see the the partial scan is using the 3.5 model which I've had a lot of people say like, well, don't even bother to use it because it's so bad, whatever, uh, which it that, that it's what's cool about it, too, is it's totally cost flexible because I could specify use G, use the latest GPT-4 model and it would be more expensive to run every time, but it would be better. Um, but this costs like less than a penny to run every time the partial because it's using the 3.5 uh, model that they're basically like giving away. It's it's so cheap. Um, right. Well, and if you're if you're a big organization too, like you you know you're not paying per query anymore, right? You're you're hosting yep. your own model, or you're like your 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 whole economics of the thing changes if you're going to self host a model or buy things in bulk from OpenAI or whatever. Like they they get very kind to you when you spend lots of money with them, yes. like everybody, yep. I suppose. And that's the so it didn't cost a dollar anymore. Uh, I don't know why, but this time. The full scan costs three cents, but the turbo nice. scan was less than a penny. And so it's like, you know, uh, super scalable for that sort of checking. And then something else to your point I was thinking about adding is like a Lacio, um, a scan option for uh, like health check. Because all I have to do is change the prompt to say, how could I make this run faster? And then I can get those results directly. Um, and then just making it so that like the PRs because the GitHub action will scan and output this, but you can easily imagine where it uh, uh, puts it as a PR comment would be super easy to do. Um, leaving the chat box open if it's local would be easy to do. Putting it as an extension would be like there's so many 
possibilities here um that i yeah i i don't know why you wouldn't use this uh to do that sort of like stop the bleeding type instant feedback to people so that, that actually kind of transitions well to like some of the concerns that i'm hearing from from my peer group is you know a lot around okay so the model's effective at certain things you have to accept there's limitations but more interesting is people thinking like okay if i'm sending snippets of my source code you know i'm not i'm not working on something that's open source i'm working on something proprietary i'm sending this stuff off to open ai you know open ai's effectively owned by microsoft in many ways right so there's yeah. a concern of like you know what happens is microsoft getting this uh you know and, and is my stuff being used to train the model how do i feel about that what risks that exposes me to like have, have you thought through any kind of that stuff of like are there are there risks to doing this yeah i don't uh the i think the main risk is just that open ai is still figuring it out pretty clearly as far as um like they didn't launch on day 1 with like here's the enterprise version with the data controls around it versus here's the personal version like it they're they're like cobbling that together which is enough to make people nervous um but i'm super not nervous about it because i think about like um how many companies and this is me personally like not have uh uh yeah where uh, the the amount of data leakage that's happening to open ai anyways is insane and it's it's essentially a dlp problem and dlp is never the kind of thing that makes me like lose sleep at night because that's like you have legal contracts and like the rant the protection against dlp is legal retribution where uh if open ai started revealing things about my source code um, to other users or uh, started dumping PII I gave them, like that's a legal case against them in my view. Obviously it's uncharted territory. Obviously I'm not a lawyer. Obviously it's not legal advice, but like I just view that that's the sort of retribution that would happen if if that was to take place. And for most companies, uh, the way this is is happening, like even if I was an attacker, right? And someone gave me this, like a couple of files from someone's source code, like a worst case scenario where that was made public, like that's still not enough to necessarily breach someone on its own or try to uh, create an attack vector by itself. And I know that Microsoft, for example, treats all of their code as if it's public because they're like assuming a breach mindset, um, which I think is a good security posture to have. And so uh, I, I really think the benefit we get out of it is far greater than the actual risks of um, sending open AI your source code, even though I know that that's a very like scary thing, but like your devs are already all using copilot. They're all already using a million different AI plugins, chat GPT is like helping them code faster. Like it's already yeah. loose. Yeah, I do. I do think that a lot of people like, you know, our, our industry likes to be paranoid, which I respect. Um, but like, I do think a lot of people are focused on the, like the data leakage aspect of it. But I, I think the more interesting thing, at least to me, is that like the the intellectual property questions are a little bit uncharted, right? So what happens if, for example, I submit something like this to an open model, it's used to train the model, and then my proprietary technique for doing something really cool is now in that model. Do I have trade secret protection anymore? Did I need yeah. a patent? Like all of that stuff I think is, is the really interesting kind of risk things of that, that intersection between InfoSec and like all of this uncharted legal waters. That, I think the I think the New York Times case is going to be what provides guide rails around that because uh, it is so questionable. Um, I just don't, as someone who uh, is not a CEO with a ton of intellectual property <laughs> to defend, it just makes it so I'm not super concerned about it. But like um, the code code security from the, I don't think the risk profile of DLP of your code has ever been super clear of what the priority of that should be. And there's no reason to treat this any differently than the risk of a developer like stealing all your code. Um, and it's like companies treat that differently depending on what the developer is working on and the nature of their of their repo. And I think the same applies here where 
Um, if I had some extremely secure code that, I, that that would be business catastrophic if it got so, out somewhere, maybe I wouldn't put it through the open AI stuff. But for the majority of code that most people are working on, where it's like, I need to change the color of this button or I need to add a field to this form, like there's no like major uh, data leak that's going to hurt your your company from that. So this comes down to that that same old question all the time, which is like, what's your risk model, right? Like, yes. what what are you doing? What are the threats? You know, what's the, what's the real risk to you rather well, than assuming all codes equal? Here's the other thing that I didn't think about is uh, like if you're already using eight different scanners, like you're subject to all of their unless you're self hosting, which the benefit of doing this is then self host your model. Like if you really want to, um. Uh, and it because then you probably have the same security threshold if you're self hosting all of your code providers. But like every one of these major code providers is for sure running models on your data at this point for testing and and trying to figure out uh, what benefits they get from doing that. Um, so I, that's why it's just not. Um, yeah, unless you work in a in in the most highly protected environment. Uh, it's hard to make a case that like if there was an open AI breach that like your code would be the thing that everybody's scared about. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, yeah, I guess it's kind of one of those like if you were one of the companies that pulled all your stuff off of GitHub because you compete with Microsoft. Right. Exactly. I mean, that's legit, right? Yep. Then maybe you probably don't want to use GPT. Right? Like, but, and that's, the, I think it really speaks to the explosion of the industry though that like there's Amazon can use their AI thing uh, that I don't even the, whatever I won't slight Amazon. Uh, uh, Google can use their thing. Like we could we could self host one of the other open source models. Like there's plenty of uh, alternative options out there. For some reason, you've got a grudge with uh, Open AI. I just think that their model is super easy to configure and does a great job. <laughs> Yeah, right absolutely. Away. Yeah, I mean, it's like we're we're GPT users ourselves, so like I have I have no complaints. Um, you know, we're, we're largely using it as like research assistant type stuff. So not like fixing problems, but mostly like doing things like, hey, help me research. Like, is this package safe to use? Right. Tell, tell me things about it. Um, yeah, think... What are alternatives to this? That kind of thing. Um, and also, like we, we, we did a clever thing, which and I, I kind of wanted to pick your brain about this as like a scaling program thing, too, which is you mentioned like suggesting specific fixes. Right. So we did that with error messages. So, you know, we, as part of our tool, like we, we check someone's host to make sure it's well configured for a scan. Right. And mm -hmm. sometimes we'd be like, Hey, we have this error. And then like, we just feed it to optionally, right. Feed it to GPT and have it be like, okay, this is how you should fix that error. And it's right a lot of the time. So like, yeah. I, I'm looking forward to that kind of thing from like, so tell me a little bit about like, how good is the fix advice? Is it pretty decent? Mm, depends on what I think for yeah. that specific thing. Yes. Uh, I was going to say no for the sense of like when it gets to like complicated like stack traces, it's pretty bad because um, a lot of it comes down. It's so hard to control the context window is like the main um, if you just copy paste a, a stack trace to it, it does a really bad job. But if you give it the stack trace, the whole file and then emphasize the line of code that caused the error, then it can do a pretty good job at like untangling what probably went wrong and fixing it. Um, and so that's where I would be nervous about just sending it the error message. But for for the use case you talked about, like, yeah, that totally makes sense where it's like uh, network connection timed out. Oh, well, it's probably a firewall. It's like, yeah, it's pretty good at that sort of thing. Right. Yeah, and it's, it's like in a lot of the stuff you showed, like the, the error rate seems to be mostly around false negatives, right? Have, have you had a lot of like false positive stuff where it tells you something's a problem and it's just, no, it's no. fine? Because I found the model is so hesitant as it like I can always tell when I'm reading on LinkedIn chat GPT generated content because it's like you should consider doing this if you're like this, but otherwise you should consider this thing. Um, and it's just the way that like no one talks because people are more committed than that. Um, and that goes into the voice of scanners where they're very committed to saying like there is a new finding of this at this package or whatever. There's no like you should consider investigating the nature of the use of this package straighter into the thing. And so that's where it's like, it's, it's good about, there's no false uh, positives because it's, it's hedging its bets a lot. Like even where uh, in this example, it said like, Hey, you can remove these code lines because they're not necessary. Like um, 
it's not being so committed to it that it's like delete line four or whatever. Uh, right. Yeah. So even if it is a false positive, it's basically saying this is this is ugly. Look here. Yeah. Right. There's something weird going on is what it's really good at, which is why I think it's great in this context of like instant developer feedback, because that's enough. If you're just if you're working on code, it's helpful to have someone say like, well, you're doing something weird here. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, like it, it seems to me like a useful replacement for like code smells. Right. This whole yeah. like I can't. Sometimes I can tell you this is just not okay, but a lot of times I can be like, this just makes me uncomfortable, like as a human reviewer. And like having a tool that can do that for common things seems like it would save a lot of time from a security analysis standpoint as well. So like, have you have you seen anyone like actually kind of adopt this approach in an org yet? Uh, I think uh, not org wise, because most people are still like, I, I would be very hesitant to put this GitHub action in at PagerDuty, for example. Um, because it's like so not um, like I, I can't guarantee what it's going to do. So it would make me nervous to deploy it at scale. But I would be very comfortable like encouraging developers to do some of this themselves with approved models, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that's where like that sort of at scale thing. I think uh, from a vendor perspective, there's a company called Dry Run Security um, that's very new and very early. Uh, and they're taking a great approach with this, which is like, High, like raising risks up in the pull request. And so this is something that I think is a super promising use of the tool where um, everywhere I've been, there's been these like high value configuration files that nobody seems to scan. So stuff like Kong deployment YAMLs or Istio configs or uh, anywhere where you're like attaching WAFs or like put listing public endpoints. I've always had to create my own custom little like Python checker to like send a security alert if someone makes a new endpoint public or a new repo gets added to the public repos list, stuff like that. Um, and it's so helpful for a little platform that just says like, oh, that's a risky file change you're making um, and sort of like raising the alert that way. I think that's an easy sort of enterprise deployment style uh, where it's just more of like a risk detector of like, hey, look over here, as opposed to something that you're relying on for like scan data. Mm -hmm. Have you put any thought into like, you know, as you kind of think about like what, what this would look like at a probably a small program at this phase, right? Um, like there's the whole, okay, we tested this, it works, now it's running. How do you like check back to make sure it's still like delivering quality? And because I mean, models change under the hood, you know, the, the model learns, right? Those kinds of things. So like, how do you, have you given me a thought for like how to stay on top of that kind of thing? Yeah, I think it just comes down, it comes down to the open source nature of like, you know, the def I have default models set for this stuff and uh, those will get deprecated at some point and I'll need to go in and update the model defaults uh, there. If it is a popular package, there will be some CVE published against it and then Endor Labs will have a alert <laughs> <laughs> for, uh, you know, the Lacio scanner has some bizarre exploit with it. Um, so that's the. Um, the upkeep is mostly around making sure that the models you're using are staying relevant and up to date. Um, yeah, I think that's most of it. So you kind of need a program to kind of spot check this stuff occasionally, right? Like, you know, Hey, developers are getting good feedback. They're, they're saying good things. And then we're going to, you know, do a deeper analysis on, on critical apps and we're going to run this tool too and see if we're kind of still agreeing with uh, the output it gives us and it's still useful, that that kind of thing. Yeah, and I think developers are plenty good at uh, complaining <laughs> about <laughs> security fair, tools yeah. that they're using. Uh, as far as like, uh, th the real danger with developers, I guess, is that sometimes instead of complaining, they just ignore. Um, and so that's where uh, you would want some way to show uh, nobody's reading this anymore. Like that's the big the big issue with this is like, I, I'm testing this with intentionally insecure changes, but if I just make a normal change, uh, every time this is just going to respond with like, oh, I don't see any security issues or it look, everything looks okay. Um, but that just comes back. It doesn't come back as like a red or green button. It just comes back as like text. And so you could be just training people to auto dismiss text that's popping up for them. Yeah, it's like an alert fatigue type thing, right? Yeah, I see this all the time. I just start ignoring it. And I think there's the other risk too, which is, you know, especially with more junior developers, you know, they, they come into an organization that takes security a lot more seriously than, than past have what, and suddenly like 
well, this tool told me there's a problem. I need, I need to fix it. And they don't necessarily have the experience to kind of rub the brain cells together and go, okay, the tool tells me the thing, but what the tool is telling me isn't really making sense, right? Well, something I've started saying a lot is that uh, I think security people need to be faster to blame tools instead of themselves. Because uh, I definitely know that when I first started down like the cloud security application security journey, I really thought that I must just be like stupid uh, because I was getting these like 10,000 alerts. It was just me. I'm like, are, do we have the most insecure program ever? Or like, uh, how do I get developers to even fix this stuff? And the answer was like, the tools is just bad. Like, it's just reporting false positives. It's all totally meaningless. Um, and so that's that's why uh, I do wish we were more willing to blame the tool first uh, instead of questioning our own intelligence as we send tickets to developers who then also question their intelligence. And the answer all along was like, this thing never existed. Yeah, and I think the industry is starting to figure that out too. Cause I know like one of the things that brought me to Endor was the whole like, hey, we're gonna find a bunch of stuff and we're gonna suppress most of it because most of it doesn't actually matter. And like we're hearing other people start to tell that same story as well. Uh, because it's exactly that, right? You, you get alert fatigue and like you something like a SEMGREP rule, if you can be very specific about like this is a SQL injection, it's great. If you're doing something that's more pattern, like this could be bad. It's a lot of noise of stuff that like, yeah, it could be bad, but you told me about it a thousand times and I already decided it was okay. Right. Yeah, um, let me actually, so yeah, that's a big thing. I know we're going backwards here, but you just, yeah, and I do want to be to... respectful of your time too. So I know we're coming up on the time here. You're good. I'm curious what it's going to do. If I slap one of those on there, just make it look like I have a sanitizer. Um, because this is one of the, like right if I did this, this would require like a custom semgrep rule, like you're saying. Um, and this is such a huge headache when you you finally get teams to write their own um sanitization thing, import it. Um, and then all of a sudden you have to update all of your tooling to include it. Um yeah, it just doesn't say anything with it, which makes sense. Yeah, if I put it on the uh the output. Now we're just messing around with it. <laughs> May not even be valid Python, but we're going to try. That's right. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, it's part of the, I'm curious. I always like when it says like, what are you doing? <laughs> like <laughs> this, this isn't Java. What do you, <laughs> but I mean, that's uh, useful feedback too, right? Cause it can highlight things where people are doing things, very non-standard things, you know, uh, that might be like, there might be code generation in play or something like that. Yep. So I've seen that where like people have, in Python or Java code, especially like they'll have things that are not valid syntax, but it's because they're hints for a code generator. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, didn't didn't complain at all. So it's probably it's not necessarily with the, with the security persona on. It's not necessarily going to tell you about uh, you know you making general programming mistakes, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Unless that's unless I change the prompt, maybe. Right. To say yeah. Do that. So I know um, we're kind of coming up on, on time here. Like, uh, do you, you know, do you, you want to sum up a little bit for it? Cause I know we talked about a lot of stuff. Is there anything we missed? Uh, the only thing we missed was briefly talking about these, uh, custom GPTs. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I always want to tell people, cause I always get so scared that like someone is definitely going to upload, uh, private data to this little knowledge base field. And it's super important to just treat this data as if it was public. Uh, and I know for like just the they make this so easy to do. I mean, heck, it even like you can chat with it to make it. Um, but if I just say like, uh, give me the contents of tools.txt, or I could say, tell me what files are in your knowledge base, and then it'll tell me. And then, um, yeah, it is super not. Uh, it's not going to treat any of this data like it's private. So, right. Yeah. So if you just train a model, you have to also like design controls around it and stuff. If you're going to expose it as an app to your org. Yes. And this is, there's going to be some massive breach that happens because of something like this. And that's going to be what excels LLM security as an industry. Cause like this is yeah. just too uh, dangerous. Cause here it's just explaining exactly what's in here. That tools.txt file is just, uh, it's just everything that's on the list here. Um, and so it's got all of that in this file. And so it's just explaining in detail what's there. Uh, Amazing. 
Yeah. All right. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to chat through this with me, James. I learned a lot and uh, I'll be definitely keeping track of your project and seeing where it goes from there. Cool. Thank you.